Bibles is going to First Corinthians chapter eleven. Maybe it's appropriate to use the last line of coming out found the very blessing to just set the tone for this uh, message this morning. When we pray, take take my heart, take and see that all my thoughts are about. The question for us is when we come to church, what is our what is our attitude and how do we approach coming to church on a Sunday? Many people today think coming to church on a Sunday is to experience a le- an electrifying atmosphere where we are ramped up to worship God. And uh, the tone set in the song here, take my heart and take and seal it. When we, when we come to offer our hearts to the Lord, um, we often find that, and, and we feel it even when we evaluate our own, our own hearts, we, we say it's inadequate. It's an inadequate gift because my heart is evil and wicked and it's perverse. And, and even, even in my best efforts, I'm not holy enough to give this gift to the Lord. And so the question is, here is my heart, I will take, you take it, and you seal it, all your thoughts about it. Take it, make it something else. And so we we actually come to church for heart surgery. And so here's the question, you know, if you you approach a hospital, if you approach the emergency room, you go to visit someone who's who's going through uh, a difficult time like that, uh, that that needs medical attention, and here we're saying it's, it's a spiritual medical attention. If you were to hear club music coming from the hospital, um, you, would, you would find it very strange. You would find it very strange that this is the kind of atmosphere that the church wants if we're truly serious about having open heart surgery before the Lord with His Word, with the light of His Word shining and showing us what is going on in your heart and what's, what needs to be dealt with to make you fit for heaven. You see, we don't need to be ramped up and electrified to be made ready for heaven. Um, that comes when your heart is able to, to bear the, the pumping of the blood through your veins and when you've been made ready for, the, for, the, for heaven. And so a healthy heart will, will pump well. You don't need to artificially keep it pumping with a drumbeat. So, uh, with that said, we approach this text in 1 Corinthians 11. And if you thought that uh, Ephesians 5 could get someone arrested, um, I think uh, 1 Corinthians 11 will get you stoned these days. See, your brother Shadrach, you agree with me there with, his, with that smile. It's one that many people um, rather ignore or stay away from, because even in your ESV you would read uh, their head coverings. And just like we read now in Jeremiah, where the women were offering to the, the goddess in heaven, so today our culture is saturated with feminism and uh, the idea of the equality of women and some, sometimes even the superiority of women. And so, so to even suggest that God has some sort of order for men and women in society and even in the church is a, is a, big, um, a big no-no today. Again, like we said in the in the family Bible class, we often think that addressing certain things biblically, people don't understand the Bible because their culture doesn't match or, or doesn't allow people to understand certain things from Scripture. And if we're going to allow our culture to define for us what is appropriate, we need to take the Bible out of its context and apply it there to to our to our day and time somehow change some of the things that's in Scripture to fit with our day and time. What we're going to end up with is, um, is just affirming ourselves in our, in our problems. It's not going to, do, to deal with our heart problems. And so what we're seeking to do is, encountering the text as it is, what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church here in, in this time, and to see what are the principles upon which he builds certain traditions or customs. And then we ask the question, how are we in this day and time to proceed with what's in the text? And so when I say something that's, that's, that's uh, causing your head to raise a little bit maybe, 
ask yourself a question, is he talking to me from the text? Because that's what I'm endeavoring to do now, before we get to the application of this. I might touch on some of the application throughout this as I see we progress. I have to somehow proceed in a way, also keeping in mind and seeing your expressions on your faces. It's one of the important things why we preach to an audience. I need to be able to see if there are confused looks. If there's a, if there's a, a confusion, I need to address certain things better. But if there's an understanding, we progress quicker. Now, let's read together from verse 1. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions, even as I delivered them to you. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. If a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but a woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now before I come to the exposition of this part, 1 Corinthians 11 starts in verse 2 with a now I commend you. And there's a larger section in which Paul is addressing certain things here, and the theme of what he's addressing now is the orderliness of the church, which ends in 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, you see there the discussion from 26, orderly worship. And so Paul is coming here with some general observations as to the creation of man and woman, and to the general behavior between men and women, and specifically then their prayer and prophesying. Then he talks about the Lord's Supper in verse 17 of chapter 11. Then he's going to address the spiritual gifts in the church. And then he's going to talk about love in chapter 13. And then he's going to talk about prophecy and tongues in the worship service, verse chapter 14. And then he's going to talk about the orderliness of worship. So in all of this, he's, he's addressing orderliness in the church, but also the orderliness from the church that extends to the ordering of everything in the life of the Christian. And so you can say this is true even in our day, what we find in what I've just said about our culture being one um, in which we try and apply the Bible, and we say we need to apply these things and see the example of the church in order to apply it in our families, in our workplace, in our home, and not the other way around. You see, we have a tendency to, to turn it on its head and say, I need, to, I need to see the things working properly in the world around. Isn't that sometimes how we pray? Oh Lord, let the world, world just be a little bit more organized, then more people will come to the knowledge of how you order things. And so we think that God has to order certain things outside the church, and then there'll be more order inside the church. Where Paul is making the argument, no, we need to be more organized in the church so that we influence the, the society outside. But yes, also use 
the general revelation, the general way in which society perceives differences between men and women in a way. So we even see Paul making use of the culture and the traditions in his own city, even. Now let's go a bit slower then. One modern day commentator writes this this passage, 1 Corinthians 11, is full of notorious exegetical difficulties. You would have noticed as I have read, one of the difficulties is the word woman and man and husband and wife. All throughout it's the same Greek word. You have to decide when is it woman, when is it wife, when is it husband, when is it man. And you need to determine that by context. And it's notoriously difficult, especially when we're so soaked in the context of distinguishing or not distinguishing the roles of men and women in the world. So, it's full of notorious exegetical difficulties, and because of these exegetical difficulties, the modern day write, the commentator writes, some have concluded that it is not part of Paul's writings. Now, if someone tells you it's not part of Paul's writings, uh, most of the time uh, it's a, it's a, um, it's a solution <laughs> to a problem and saying, well, we can ignore this because it's not really, it doesn't really belong in the Bible. And so the question becomes, why would people want a certain section of the Bible not to be included? You say, well, as I said, you know, we rather ignore this. And so if we as Christians ignore this, it's easy for someone just to come up with an explanation to say, oh, it doesn't belong in the Bible anyway, just remove it out. And so we as Christians need to stand firm and say, well, even if there are certain things that are uncomfortable to address from the Word of Scripture, we still acknowledge this is the Word of God. And so we come with a certain commitment to the Bible to say this is the Word of God, and we want to allow the Bible to critique us. We want to allow God to critique us. We are not like the academics who critique the Bible and come to a conclusion like, this is not a writing of Paul, or this doesn't belong in the Bible. So beware of those who are authorities over what is in the Bible and what is not. And beware of the temptation, even for yourself, to be the judge of what belongs in the Bible and what does not belong in the Bible. Be very, very careful to make statements like that. And so we live in a time of critical thinking, of critical criticism, but our question here is, what are you critiquing? What is it that we are critically thinking about? If you're going to use your critical thinking to criticize the Word of God and so make the, what God has to say of no importance, it's a dangerous place to be. The question is, will you use your critical thinking and your critical reasoning to see how God is critiquing us. How God is critiquing our society. How God is critiquing the church. How God is critiquing us as individuals. To say, how may we then listen to Him? The question for us, are we desirous to be examined by God? Do we come, do we approach this text then? To be examined by God, to have our hearts open, and to see, is there any way in us that is grievous? Psalm 139, verse 23, should be our attitude. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So when we approach this text, instead of debating about what's your opinion of the verse, what's your opinion of the verse, we're asking this question, what does God have to say? We acknowledge His presence with us, as he calls us together and as we approach him, so we acknowledge that he is the one speaking to us. We have not come, in other words, to be God. Oh God, you don't know our times. Oh God, you don't know women today. Oh God, you don't know men today. Let me just first tell you. Let me tell you about men and women. Let me tell you about the time we live in. How foolish is that to come to the Lord and say, let me tell you about the time we're living in. God is just looking at you and saying, do you think brought everything to this point? Where were you when I uh, 
when I was there, when people invented the printing press, translated the Bible? Where were you when the PSD the Bible was translated? Where were you? God questions Job. Where were you when I created this? Where were you when I made this? So be very careful in your approach to lecture God on his own creation and lecture God on our own times. God will lecture you about how you need to behave. Will we allow God to lead us? Will we allow Him to lead us, especially as it relates to orderliness in our behavior as Christians, orderliness even in the church, and orderliness as men and women in our households and in society? So will we allow God to lead us here? And then just this shout of exclamation you can expect from people in the world. Talk about hierarchical and patriarchal. Yes, absolutely. There is a hierarchical structure and there is a patriarchal structure in Scripture up front. Can I come away from it? What do I mean by a patriarchal structure? God is our Father in heaven. And He is at the top of that structure and all of this. And He orders everything under Him and under Christ, who He has appointed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy, and the Father of Christ Jesus is at the head of that hierarchy. So Paul starts here, and it's difficult to determine if it's uh, really a start or a finish. I think it's a it's a it's a both and here in verse one. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ is sort of the full stop to what has has gone before, and it's also sort of the introduction to what is to follow. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. You see the hierarchy works in a certain way. You see the orderliness functioning in a specific way. Paul is not saying I am at the top of the structure. He's saying I am following Christ. And that's why you need to follow. It's that uh, illustration of the follow the leader. It depends on your place in the line. If you're in the front of the line and you're second, third, or fourth, or sixth, if you do what the leader does and those who have gone before you, if you imitate them, then the rest imitate. But if one makes the wrong move, if one is not careful in how he hands over the previous action or uh, imitates the one before him, what happens? You see the structure breaking down, downwards. To illustrate this, you would see this in a church, for instance, when... Um, when you have families where a husband is supposed to be the head of the home, the wife is, in, is, is submissive to, to her husband, and the children are well taught, you can see when it's functioning well, when it's functioning correctly, when the father is teaching and taking the responsibility to teach his wife, to teach his children, and you can see the family unity. And then you can see families where the husband has not taken that responsibility seriously. Or where uh, maybe the husband-wife relationship as well, but they're struggling with their children. You can see when there's a breakdown in the orderliness in the home. And then, publicly speaking, pastoral, pastoral counseling, uh, we are taught you have to go and look where is the breakdown in that orderliness. Because the Bible does hold up this particular order of things. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul says, I commend you because you remember me in everything. Now, that's a very strange phrase. Because up to this point, Paul has just been fighting for his own, uh, for his own apostolic ministry at this point. Because the Corinthians at many points have uh, doubted his apostolic ministry. And so here he's commending them because they remembered him in everything and maintained the tradition. So it would seem as there, if, if there is some traditions or customs that the Corinthian church kept, that they were indeed doing, that they were indeed remembering Paul in, and Paul is even acknowledging, as I delivered them to you. So maybe there's a little bit of a little bit of sarcasm, maybe. Paul is saying, well, you disown me as your apostle, but still you're doing the things which I taught you to do. So not that bad of an apostle, maybe. And so he leads them in this and he says, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions, even as I delivered them to you. And then we look down at verse 17 in the following instructions. I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for better, but for worse. So it seems also as if he's setting up this contrast. For one thing, I'm commending you, and for one other thing, I'm not commending you. So he's commending them so that he may later 
not commend him in another way. So if it's, it's part of the rhetoric of the, or part of the wisdom here in addressing the problems in the church. Now, I guess a very important statement here. Maintain the traditions, even as I deliver them to you. <coughs> We're Baptists. We thought that the church and church tradition and all of these things were not that important. How important is tradition and ritual and uh, certain orderly, orderliness? It's, it's not very important or high up on our list. We think that tradition, even in our in our um, differences with the Roman Catholic Church, we think it's their tradition. You know, we say, look at how traditional they are. Or we look at the Anglican Church and we say, look at how traditional and ritualistic they are. We resist that kind of traditional ritualistic uh, worship. But yet there is a commendation here from the Apostle Paul about traditions that are kept and maintained. So is tradition bad? Is tradition useful? Is tradition good? Why do we have tradition? Now, tradition is much like personal habits. And tradition is just a corporate habit. And tradition is a corporate habit. Just like you would have personal habits. What's your personal habits? You would get up in the morning and I hope you would go to brush your teeth. And you don't have to think every day how to brush your teeth. You know instinctively how to brush your teeth because you do it regularly. And by doing it regularly, you have healthy teeth. The same goes for Christian tradition. Why do we come to church on Sundays? Well, it's a healthy Christian tradition to do. Do you think about why we do it every single Sunday you come? You don't have to be convinced every Sunday of the importance of coming on Sunday. You just recognize the benefit. You sometimes, just like you have the fresh breath after brushing your teeth, you have a fresh breath of fresh air because you came to church on Sunday. And so you can feel that this is good for you in doing these things. And so Paul commends them for maintaining these traditions and orderliness. Why do we have these traditions and orderliness? It's for the health of the church. It's for the health of the people in the church. And so Paul is commending them. This is healthy. And you will see in verse 17, the thing he does not commend them for is an unhealthy tradition that has come in. Because he's saying, I'm not commending you for how you take the Lord's Supper. Because if this becomes the way in which you eventually take the Lord's Supper, you are going on the wrong, in the wrong direction. Because they took the Lord's Supper and is selfish, not caring for their brothers, not caring for one another. And so here is the question. What traditions in church? What traditions? Does our text tell us which traditions are important and which not? Well, it seems to me like our text is saying Paul is commending them that the church is remembering him in everything, and that they maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. And so the traditions here is a is, is the noun, the traditions, and the verb is deliberate. It's the same root word for traditions and deliver. So the noun is the body, it's the body of the traditions. And then in delivering that, the tradition itself is passed on how? By doing, by living, by behaving. That comes back to verse 1. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. How do they receive this tradition from Paul? Well, Paul himself did this in the church. Paul himself said this is how it's supposed to work. And then he himself submitted himself to that tradition. Because it's not a tradition instituted by Paul. It's a tradition that was handed down and it's handed down. Now these traditions here that are spoken of is not so much a written body of tradition. This would be specific behaviors and speech and ways of talking to one another and customs in relating to one another <coughs> that is orally transmitted. That would mean it's like the <coughs> wisdom of the grandmother or the mother telling the kids, don't desire that toy too much. You know, forget about that toy for a bit. And focus on your school. It's better to focus on your education than to focus on your desires all the time. These lessons would be the kind of traditions that's passed over. The principles of conduct, the principles of relating to one another. Now one suggestion in how traditions come about 
And this is our modern day way of looking at it. Each family has their own traditions. And so the parents decide for their children. This is the traditions we have. And we don't have to make reference to um, what would be good for our kids, maybe, or what would be good for our family, necessarily, or how God ordains them. We can just come up with it because it's our kids and we can live the way we want. Now, teaching your kids that, then the next generation becomes a place where they say, well, we can live this with however we want because our parents showed us they live however they want, and when we reach a certain age, we can live as we want. And then we teach our kids the same thing, and when they grow up, they can live as they want. And what do you end up with? Every generation is living as they want. You end up with an individual preference, each one with an individual preference, trying to start a new tradition, but the, the tradition becomes no tradition. That becomes the tradition. Anything that was a tradition from my parents, I refuse to accept, and I'll do my own traditions. And then the next generation rejects your traditions and goes back to the grandparents' traditions. And then there's the skip. Because there's no transmission of what is good, what is healthy. There's no consistency. Because it's up to every individual preference. So the dangers of that is there is no unity. The second danger is there is no meaningful and purposeful communication of an external standard. <coughs> Listen very carefully. There is no meaningful and purposeful communication of an external standard. If I am the standard, it's not an external standard that needs to be conformed to. If I am the standard and how I feel, it's all an internal standard. And when I pass that one to my kids... The only thing they'll learn is that the only standard in your life is your internal standard, how you feel, what you think is good. And so tradition helps us to understand there is a meaningful, purposeful, external standard. What is our meaningful, purposeful, external standard? The Word of God. God is our external standard of what we should, what we ought to, what we ought not to. God is the standard. And so the traditions help us to know that the standard is external to us. It doesn't come out bubbling from our heart. And if we have no purposeful communication of an external standard, what we have is only freedom of expression and radical individualism. The thing we see so much of in our world today. You can be whatever you want to be. You can say whatever you want to say. You can do whatever you want to do. By the way, right, most of the people trying to defend free speech, <laughs> free speech, all right, you can say whatever you want, whenever you want, but you don't have the right to demand people listen to you. <laughs> I can tell you, please shut up, I'll go talk somewhere else. I have the right to refuse to listen to nonsense. I think that should be the first amendment in the world. <clears throat> I'm, I'm able to turn off the nonsense of this world. Another suggestion here, where do the traditions come from? Come from? It, it, it would be up to the apostles, up to the elders to receive these traditions, these uh, customs, and then to teach and to encourage. To teach and to encourage thoughtful and meaningful, biblically-based traditions. Very careful. To encourage thoughtful and meaningful, biblically-based traditions. Because mindless, mindless, meaningless tradition becomes enslaving. Mindless and meaningless tradition becomes enslaving. What's an example of meaningless tradition? We've always done it this way, and we'll just continue to do it this way. To illustrate the point, there's a funny story my wife likes to tell. The grandmother cooked her chicken in a particular way, and she would chop off the little wings, the little wings of the chicken, and then put it in the pot. And so she taught her daughter how to do this, and she would chop off her little wings. And the daughter wondered why, but she'd never understood why, and she just continued doing that. And when she passed that on to her daughter, her daughter asked her, why do you chop off the wings? It seems like it's a waste. And the daughter says, I don't know. Grandmother does it like this, and I just continue doing it. I don't know the reason. And so the next time the little daughter goes to visit grandmother, she asks, Granny, why do you chop off the, the wings? Granny says, well, my pot is too small and the wings don't fit. So I can chop it <laughs> And that's a thoughtful, meaningful way of doing the chicken in her house. But it wasn't a thoughtful, meaningful way in the daughter's house, you see. So that's why we encourage 
thoughtful and meaningful biblically based traditions. So when we come to our day and age dealing with feminism, individuality, all of these things, there would be different traditions, customs maybe, that would be a good and thoughtful way of communicating a different standard than the standards of feminism, individuality, and all these other philosophies. How are we going to communicate differently? And so we need thoughtful and meaningful traditions, but also biblically based. We need to study our Bibles, study our scriptures to see what would be a good way of dealing with a certain problem in the culture or in the world. Another important point, we need to follow customs and traditions, and we need to do this in an atmosphere of grace and love, recognizing that the church is an atmosphere of grace and love. We're not here to make sure everyone conforms to the traditions and the standards and the, and the rituals, if it's meaningless and thoughtless. We're here to teach them the meaning and the thought behind the custom or the practice or the ritual. Here's the motivation why we would do this as a church. And then we as a church need to be convinced, yes, this is what we will be doing. This is how we are going to do it. And then we continue to do that. And one of the, the dangers is when an individual starts to leave the traditions or the practice of the church, an individual gets to decide, oh, this Sunday I'll just chop and change the tradition or the way we do things for the sake of I want to do it this way. There's a reason we do things in a particular way. To illustrate the point of doing things in this particular way in the atmosphere of grace and love, I illustrated it with an illustration. If you go to the hospital and you were to find club music coming from the hospital, that would put you off putting. The same thing when you approach a flock of sheep and you see them running around all the time so energetically and it's dangerous because what happens? They trample the young ones, they trample the weak. But when you have a calm approach, a calm atmosphere in a church, that's a place where you can find rest. Isn't, the, isn't coming together as a congregation a place where we can find rest, be healed from our sins, be forgiven, and then focus on how to go out and not be hurt again next week? And so following the customs and traditions is, in the, is also following it in the atmosphere of grace and love. So we're always appealing in this sense, and Paul is appealing to this, I commend you for following the traditions. It's good that you follow them. Paul is not, Paul is not here um, um, disciplining them, sticking to it or not sticking to it. He tells them, I commend you or I don't commend you. I think it's good if you follow this tradition, or I think it's bad when you follow going into this. And then it's up to the church, it's up to the, up to the flock to follow or not follow. And how does that work? Well, when the flock is, is hearing what Paul has to say, I commend you for this, then each individual hears, oh, this is good practice. And so they either accept or reject. And if most of the individuals in the church accept what you have as a church, the thing accepts and does. Or you have people responding with a no, we won't. And then if there's one or two who says, no, we won't, and they look around and they say, oh, well, everyone else is I'm not so well. Part of God's grace, you see, part of God's love. Part of God's grace and God's love to convince the individual of, well, you're just being stubborn. You're just, you're just being stubborn. That's a real problem today. People want to be rebellious just for the sake of rebellion. Look at teenagers today. Teenagers today want to just rebel for the sake of rebellion. And my generation, my generation, fellow guys, speak to anyone of my generation, we love to rebel for the sake of just rebellion. Oh, that's what you are? I'm just going to do the opposite. I'm going to play the devil's advocate every time. It's not good. It's not helpful. It's not loving. And so, 
Those who lead, the apostles, the pastors, the elders of the church, must exhibit grace and love in handing down these traditions or these customs or these ways in which we should be behaving. Again, because mindless and meaningless tradition becomes enslaving. And so we see the mindfulness in verse 1, the imitators of me as I am of Christ. We even see Paul allowing the church, the freedom in various places. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 15, he says, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. In 11, verse 13, he again says, Judge for yourself what I say. So how does a pastor and elder communicate the customs and the practices that the church should be following? He tries to persuade them. I think it will be better if we do this. I think it will be terrible if we do that. And then it's up to you to judge and to decide. It's up to you to see and be sensible and say, yes, I think the reasoning is sound behind this, and so I'll follow. Or to reject it. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. But be sure that you're right when you reject it. Also understand that if a pastor and an elder, and, or elders are thoughtful in how they pray and communicate, tradition or the custom. If it's, a, if it's just an off-the-cuff suggestion, you know they haven't prayed, they haven't thought, and it's, it's worthy of being rejected up front. Pastor, I don't think you prayed enough about this. But when there's thoughtful prayer, it, it wouldn't take much convincing for the flock to say, yes, I think that's good. So how do we do, how does pastors do this? Through the teaching of the word, through the explaining of certain principles as they become clearer to the church. The church, at some point, the man in the church or the woman in the church might even say, Pastor, we should actually be doing this as a church, as I understand the scripture. And then the pastor should be able to say, yes, I think you're right. You should be. Speak to the other ladies or speak to the other men. Maybe that's something we should be thinking of, should be thinking of doing. So judge for yourself. Study the scriptures, judge for yourself. There is no call here to arrest you and cause you to walk in a certain tradition, conform or be kicked out. This is a allow the Spirit of God to work in your heart, allow the Spirit of God to lead you, to convince you, to tell you what would be good, what would be helpful. And you would be able to see, if it's healthy to brush my teeth. I don't like brushing my teeth. Especially when I fall into bed on the evening, it's late. I forgot to brush my teeth. I have to work up the energy to go up and brush my teeth. The same thing goes with our traditions. Sometimes they feel like they're getting in the way. Oh, no, no, I just don't want to do this. I just don't want to uh, do it in this particular way. Oh, the way we do it is just so, oh, I don't like this. But then what we find is when we do it, it teaches us also that it's not about what I feel. So traditions help us, and God uses the traditions and the customs often to say it's not about what you feel is right. It's about what you've determined, and what I've determined to tell you is right and good and healthy for you. And then you stick to it. And so we must allow for certain freedom, Romans 14, verse 5. Um, this talks about specifically uh, the personal freedom to, to have feast days, the Jews to have feast days and the Gentiles not to have those feast days. Romans 14, verse 5, Paul says this, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all day, days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. And so with regards to traditions and customs in the church, even, you need to be fully convinced in your mind. To follow or not to follow. And to see what the consequences are is of those following it and those not following it. Now that we've addressed this, verse 3 Paul goes from the traditions that he's delivered and he says to them, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. And so now he's trying to particularly address the tradition, the custom between men and women in the church. And specifically how men and women relate to the various things in the church as well. 
So I want you to understand it. So he lays down in verse 3 the principle. So you can mark this verse as very important as a guiding principle overarching over the text. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. There is the hierarchical structure up front. There it is. That's the principle. That's the foundation. And then he moves to verse 4, and verse 4 begins with a particular situation. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Question. Were all men and all women praying and prophesying? Possibly not. This is telling us when men and when women are prophesying, what their dress should be like, wearing a head covering or not. Now there's another argument if, you, if you're a man or a woman, and you, are you ready for praying or prophesying in the church? And if you were, were to have your head covered as a man, you're not ready to pray and prophesy. If, you're, if you have your head uncovered as a woman, you're not ready to prophesy, ready to pray. Now, what is prayer and prophesying in this particular regard? We'll spend some more, some more time on this particular, but just to suggest this to you, that praying and prophesying here is a specific activity led by the Holy Spirit. This is not an activity which I feel like praying or I feel like prophesying. In the church, it's praying in the Holy Spirit. It's, pro it's prophesying in the Spirit. It is a Spirit-led activity. Men can be led by the Spirit to pray and prophesy. Women can be led to pray and prophesy. But the particular concern by Paul here is the dress and the posture of men and women in these situations. Now let me make it clear as well here that Paul is not saying every man must pray and prophesy and every woman must pray and prophesy. That's not the command. To find the imperatives that Paul is addressing to men and women, and particularly women, 1 Corinthians 14, we find three imperatives in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34 to 35. Here is the rule, here is the general rule in the church. Women should keep silent, imperative, that's an imperative. Silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. That's the imperative. Let them be in submission. As the law also says, verse 35 says, If in fact there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask, imperative, their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church. I just read from the Bible. I just want you to know that. I just read from God's Word. I did not invent what was here. I'm just explaining to you what is there. The woman should keep silent, be in submission, and ask her, their husbands at home. And then this statement, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. The word for speaking here is the word for talkativeness, general speech, just speaking in general. Freely speaking. The church is not the place of free expression for the individual. The church is not the place for the free expression of the individual. Because the church is the place where God expresses himself to sinners. Okay? That's why these general rules are there. To keep in mind the overarching principle that the church is there for God to speak to his people. God speaks to his people. We don't come to church to talk, we come to church to listen. Come to church to listen. Now, if I may, I think, I think many of you would agree that the general joke even about the men and women of the women tend to be more talkative than men. Isn't that so? Would you maybe agree with that? Okay. Don't you think that may be one of the reasons why Paul needs to seriously address that issue? I mean, don't you see it when we have 
uh, coffee or tea at church, what do you see the menu? We, we have to find something to talk about. Or we sit on coffee and we watch the women just... <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, you laugh at precisely because of that. It's true. There's a measure of truth in it. And so what Paul is here prohibiting is the free-speaking talkativeness that sometimes wanders into wanting to lead the conversation, embarrassing the men by your speech. Paul says it in another way, the same principles in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11. This sounds a little bit better. But it's the same, it's the same concern that he has when he tells Timothy about the orderliness of the church. Let a woman learn imperative. Quietly, with all submissiveness, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but rather she is to remain quiet. Now listen to the definition of this word in the Greek used for quietly and quiet. Quietness implying calm. It is used of the God-produced calm, which includes an inner tranquility that supports appropriate action. An inner tranquility that uh, supports appropriate action. It means that you don't come to church in a frantic, talkative attitude. You come to church with a quiet, and gentle, and ready, and willing to hear. Now, this includes us men as well. When you come to church, you want to hear. Women should work extra hard and have to want to listen and not just talk. <laughs> This term does not mean speechlessness. It does not mean no sound may come from a woman's mouth. So let's just clear that out of the way completely. It does not mean no sound may come from a woman's mouth. It does mean that the sounds or the speech that comes from that should be produced by this tranquility, this calm, this attitude of submissiveness and wanting to learn. And then being mindful of what's the best way to proceed in learning. Let's talk about verse 35 of 1 Corinthians 14 for a moment. If there is anything that a woman desires to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. Illustration. What happens in Bible study when a woman continues to ask questions to the pastor every time in, in a way that embarrasses her husband because her husband is sitting there I tried, to, I tried to teach her. She wouldn't listen to me. Uh, and now she's she's showing herself not in submission to her husband and, and looking to her husband for spiritual leading, but looking to another man. And that's a dangerous place to be. It's also embar it's embarrassing to her. It's embarrassing to the husband because the responsibility is here. Let them ask their husbands at home. So I know it's difficult when you're in the Bible study and you need to ask a question immediately. And uh, the idea here is that from that quiet and gentleness and that there's no need for panic. There's no need for panic because the pastor said a wrong word or maybe had the subject a little bit wrong in, in how he presented it. I pray that he doesn't really understand it the way he presented it. And he needs to be addressed on that. But from that quiet and gentleness, the world's not going to end because the pastor had the slip of the tongue or something like that. We need to have the calm, quiet, like with the doctor's names or the hospital. We need to be mindful of the atmosphere that we're in and the atmosphere that we need to create in the church or to maintain in the church. We don't need to create the atmosphere, we maintain the atmosphere. Must maintain this atmosphere of quietness and calm. So we see here in 1 Corinthians 11 to pray and to prophesy is not an instruction to pray and prophesy, but it is an orderly structure in the event of someone praying and prophesying. There are different rules for men and women. Oh, that's not fair. Different rules for men and women. That's not fair. And so we've looked at the overarching rule. Women should keep silent, be insufficient, and let them ask their own husbands at home. They should learn quietly with all submissiveness. 
So here we see in prayer and prophesying, there is a different dress, different posture in prayer and prophesying for man and woman. Man with a covered head dishonors Christ, and a woman with an uncovered head dishonors her husband. How do we get that? We see every wife who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. So a man with his head covered, look at the end of verse 4, dishonors his head. Not his head, his head Christ. Because what, where do we get that? Verse 3, the head of every man is Christ. So you have the first head prophesies with his physical head uncovered, dishonors his heavenly head, Christ. A woman who prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her husband, her head, which is the same as if her head were shaven. Now, in that time, it would be shameful for a woman to have a shaven head. I think today it's the same thing, unless you're uh, one of these feminists. It's not shameful to have your head shaved. But many women would not have their head shaved because it would be a shameful thing for them. So what we have here is a mindfulness of the relationship with our head. So I think this is a good place to close with for this, for this particular one and to pray and to digest some of the things that we've said now. Every man who prays and prophesies with his head covered, the way in which we pray as men, our posture, our dress, the way in which we behave when we approach God, communicates something. And it communicates something about what we believe Christ is our head. And there's a certain expectation It's not about what we think the proper posture, the proper idea of prayer may be. It's not what we feel in our heart. We already said that's not the standard of what we do. It's not about what I feel and how I feel. We should ask, when is it appropriate to do certain things in prayer, in speaking about Christ? Because if we can show that we are mindful in these things, let me illustrate it this way. If you are mindful in these things, you will set the example for others to be mindful of these things. If you as a man, if you are mindful that everything you do, how you approach God, how you pray, how you live in your family, how you live in your home, how you behave at work, you're communicating something about your Lord in heaven. If you're mindful and you communicate meaningfully in every interaction that you have, have to worry so much about what comes out of your mouth all the time because of the integrity of your behavior, of the thoughtfulness of your behavior. Because you see, thoughtfulness in speech begins in thoughtfulness of behavior. And that's where Paul is drawing this to. He's saying, this is the problem in the churches that you see this uncontrolled Walking is going on. In the first place, you'll see that it's not a, it's not addressed in the heart. Is that you'll see this in the churches. You'll see that women lead, women having authority over men, women just talking carelessly, gossiping away. And what Paul is doing is saying, no, we need to see that the problem with our speech and the uncontrolled way in which we speak and the uh, meaningless things that we repeat is ultimately a problem from our behavior that's wrong. We need to be careful, more careful in our behavior so that our speech and our conduct would be holy and sanctified. Because we believe in a complete transformation. Isn't it? We believe that God removes that heart of stone and gives us a new heart from which we reevaluate and reorganize our life in every aspect. Isn't it? It's not that somehow this person has become a Christian and now he just starts going to church. It's that he's behaving differently towards his parents or his spouse. Or there's a complete transformation in all areas of life. This person is considering carefully what God has to say and how God structures and all these things. So that the light of Christ may shine brighter and brighter in every area of our life as we resist in less and less and less in all areas.
as we allow him to speak to every area of our life. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the openness, the willingness to hear your word this morning. Thank you that we have been receptive to things that our culture and the world around us is teaching us to be outright rejecting. We see and we just read from your word. There is no denying that it is straight from your word because we see it. Plain old English for all of us to understand. So, Father, when we are confronted by your word in this way, we also recognize that there is a lot that we need to think about, pray about. But, Father, I pray that your people, that the church, that Christians, when they encounter your word and when they see how far short they have fallen, let us bear that guilt for a little while. Let us bear that shame of the sin that we committed for a little while. But our Father, we pray that it may quickly turn into hope and joy. Because here is an opportunity to grow in holiness and sanctification. Here is an opportunity to repent and to experience more of the joy that comes from repenting and living our life in accordance with your word. And so, Father, may we truly experience the joy that comes from obedience, deep in our heartfelt joy, when we implement what we learn from the Scripture. Father, help us in the coming weeks when we'll have to specifically address some of the particular ways in which we could apply the principles in this text to our day and age, keeping in mind what is going on in the world around us, keeping in mind how we communicate to our brothers and sisters in Christ, how we communicate to our families, how we communicate these things, not by our speech, O Lord, but by our living. Help us all to have a quiet and gentle spirit, ready to learn what you have to teach us, O Lord. Keep good order in the church so that it may be a blessing to all. Thank you for your grace and your mercy to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.